A reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 9, and verse number 31. Is it on the board? No? Oh, okay. So, what I'll do is I'll chant really slow so you can follow along. Or if you have your phones, you can also you can follow on that. Vasudaya Dharanaya Nhasta Subhas Vasudaya Vasudaya Dharanaya Nhasta Subhas Tadhikshaya Vasu Gata Yudasman Maha Nivritti Sarvendriya Vritti Vibhavmas Tustava Janyam Brisa Jan Janardanam Sudaya Dharanaya Hatha Subhas Tadhiksaya Vasugata Yudas Malaha Devritta Sarvendriya Vrita Vibhamas Tustava Janyam Visajan Janardanam Visudaya Dharanaya Hatha Subhas Tadiksaya Vasugata Yudas Madaha Nivritta Sarvendriya Vritta Viva mas Tustava Jan Yam Brisa Jan Janardan Hum Thank you. 
Ladies, any ladies would like to try? Okay. Visudaya. By purified. Dharayanaha. Dharanaya. Meditation. Hatha Asuba. One who has main, minimized the inauspicious qualities of material existence. Tat, him, iksaya, by looking on, eva, simply, asu, immediately, gata, having gone away, yuda, from the arrows, shramaha, fatigue, nivritta, being stopped, sarva, all, indriya, senses, vritti, activities, vivrama, being widely engaged, tustava, he prayed, janyam, the material tabernacle, vishrajan, while quitting, janardanam, to the controller of the living beings. So this <clears throat> section is about Bhishma Dev. He has now just engaged in battle with Krishna. And now after this exchange, he has now reached his level of pure meditation. <clears throat> By pure meditation, looking at Lord Krishna, he at once was freed from all material inauspiciousness and was relieved of all bodily pains caused by the arrow wounds. Thus, all the external activities of his senses at once stopped and he prayed transcendentally to the controller of all living beings while quitting his material body. Hmm. Purport. The material body is a gift of the material energy, technically called illusion. Identification with the material body is due to forgetfulness of our eternal relationship with the Lord. For a pure devotee of the Lord like Bhishma Dev, his illusion was at once removed as soon as the Lord arrived. Lord Krishna is like the sun and the illusory external material energy is like darkness. In the presence of the sun, there is no possibility that darkness can stand. Therefore, just on the arrival of Lord Krishna, all material contamination was completely removed, and Bhishma Dev was thus able to transcendentally be situated by stopping the activities of the impure senses in collaboration with matter. I'll read that one again. <clears throat> Therefore, just on the arrival of Lord Krishna, all material contamination was completely removed, and Bhishma Dev was thus able to be transcendentally situated by stopping the activities of the impure senses in cooperation with matter. The soul is originally pure, and, and so also are the senses. By material contamination, the senses assume the role of imperfection and impurity. By revival of contact with the Supreme Pure Lord Krishna, the senses again become freed from material contamination. Bhishma Dev attained all these transcendental conditions prior to his leaving the material body because of the presence of Krishna. The Lord is the controller and benefactor of all living beings. That is the verdict of all Vedas. He is the supreme eterni eternity and living entity amongst the living beings, amongst the eternal living beings. So there is a reference to one verse. 
Nitya Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam Ekubahunam Vidadati Kamman from Katya Upanishads. He alone provides all the necessities for all kinds of living beings. Thus he provided all facilities to fulfill the transcendental desires of his great devotee Vishmadev, who prayed as follows. Om Ajnantimirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Stavtitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pasyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So Grandfather Bhishma Dev is one of the Mahajans. That means he is empowered to teach religious principles. There are 12, only 12 Mahajans. And they teach the science of Bhakti Yoga from different perspectives without changing the essential principles. We have, there is Brahma, there is Lord Shiva, or Kumaras, we have Prahlad Maharaj, we have Janaka Maharaj, we have the uh, Yamaraj, we have Sukadev Goswami, um, who else? Ba Bali Maharaj, Kapila Dev, and uh, here also we have Bhishma Dev, and one more, four Kumaras we mentioned, Swayabhu, no, 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 he's not. So it's mentioned in one verse in this same chapter that there are 12 persons who are authorized to teach. So we are from the Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya, so our Sampradaya head, Sampradaya means those teachings that come from Krishna down to the empowered representative, in our case it's Lord Brahma, down through the disciplic succession and then it ultimately comes to us through the series of spiritual teachers. So one has to follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. Mahajano yena katasapanta. In this verse from the Mahabharata explains that outside of the system of the Mahajans, the, uh, there is no authorized spiritual system of learning the process of bhakti yoga which is the principle of attaining the lotus feet of the supreme lord so one has to follow the mahajans and this verse mahajano yena katasapanta means that the truth of religious principles are hidden the word hidden gupta in the hearts of all of these great souls so one must approach the Mahajans through the process of disciplic succession according to our spiritual teachers who come in that line. Otherwise, religious principles are not sound, are not what we say, authorized. Here, Bhishmade, he is an interesting personality. Um, he had he had the benediction given by his father, King Santanu, that he could die only when he decided to die. <laughs> he pleased his father in such a way that he performed great austerities by refusing to take the throne in order for his father to marry Sachivati, the daughter of a fisherman who his father very much desired to marry. His father was so pleased that he gave him the benediction that um, you will die only when you want to die. <laughs> so here on the battlefield, we're hearing what is happening is that 
um, the battle between the Pandavas and the Kurus are going on. But Bhishma Dev is connected with the Pandavas, although he's on the side of the Kurus. This is a long story, how he actually accepted the role of the Kurus against the Pandavas, who he was sympathetic to the Pandavas. He did it out of Kshatriya responsibility, and he did it because Deodhana arranged for all the livelihood he needed. He had no connection. He was a brahmachari in one sense, but really not connected with any ashram, and so Duryodhana maintained him nicely. And therefore, he was obliged to reciprocate with Duryodhana when Duryodhana requested him to fight on his side against the Pandavas. Of course, there's another reason also. Jai Sisi Radhagopinath Ki Jai. And the other reason was that Bhishma Dev could not be defeated by anyone. In fact, he had the power just himself, he could annihilate the entire Pandava army by himself. He was so powerful. And he was so expert in military science. And at the same time, he was, you know, he was 170 years old during this battle. This is, his age was 170. And, uh, Duryodhana is seeing that Bhishma Dev is not fighting to his capacity. And he calls him, he said, Grandfather, I know you have some sentiment for the Pandavas, but still you must fight because you, are, you have agreed to fight on, the, on our side, but you're not fighting. I can see you're sympathetic to the Pandavas. So when you tell a Kshatriya they're not fighting, that's an insult. <laughs> it's a great insult. <laughs> so he was really, uh, he said, all right, tomorrow I will destroy the five Pandavas. I have five arrows here, and the Pandavas will be finished tomorrow in the battle. Duryodhana said, very good. But let me keep those arrows for you. Tomorrow I will give you before the battle. Okay? Now Krishna knows what's going to happen. He's realizing his devotees are going to be killed. There's no way they could fight against Bhishma Dev. And so he says to Arjun, he said, Arjun, you remember? Duryodhana, he owes you a favor. Now it's time to collect that favor. <laughs> he has five arrows. Ask him for the five arrows. <laughs> And uh, so Arjun goes, because in the evening, although they were fighting during the day, they would sit and talk friendly talks in the evening time, although they were, you know, enemies during the day. This is Kshatriya, you know, nature. And they fight on religious principles, and there's also other reasons, but they don't fight like today, where, you know, people hide behind different... Uh, you know, they throw bombs and women and children get killed. And Kshatriya Dharma, they fight according to certain rules and regulations. And they have a respect for their enemy who was also good fighters. So at night, of course, and the Kurus and the Pandavas were related to each other. They were family members. It was a fratricidal war. And so Arjun came to Diodhani. And Duryodhana welcomed them. Oh, Arjun, you come. Yes. Why have you come? Well, I, you remember, you promised me this one favor. And now I've come to collect that favor. What is that? Well, you have five arrows that you're keeping for Bhishma Dev. Give me those five arrows. <laughs> Duryodhana could not refuse the request of Arjun because he had made a promise. And so he gave him the five arrows. And the next day, when Bhishma Dev came to collect the arrows, he found out that they were no longer there. And then he understood this is the trick of Krishna. So then, when he got onto the battlefield that day, he fought like... <laughs> and he was, he was just annihilating the Pandava army. Then when he was face to face with Arjun, Arjun had no chance to fight against him. 
And so he just shot so many powerful arrows, which were like missiles, and destroyed the chariot of Arjun. Now Krishna is on the chariot. He's driving the chariot. And so Krishna, Krishna promised, I'm not going to fight. <laughs> At the beginning of the battle, Duryodhana was there, Arjun was there, and he said, I'll give you a choice. You can take either me or my armies. If you take me, I'm not going to fight. <laughs> so Duryodhana said, well, if you're not going to fight, what good are you? you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll take your armies. So Krishna's armies went with, the, with uh, Duryodhana. And Arjun understood that he actually had the, the better of the deal. So he took Krishna. And he said to Krishna, well, you're not going to fight, but can you drive my chariot? <laughs> He's telling the Supreme Personality of God and giving him some service. <laughs> and Krishna agreed. He agreed to drive the chariot for Arjuna. Now Krishna is driving the chariot and he's trying to maneuver, but Bhishma Dev is so expert at fight, fighting that the chariot's getting... At one point the, the wheel fell off the chariot and, and Arjuna fell to the ground. And Krishna knew. Now he had promised that I'm not going to fight. And what to do? Now his devotee is in danger. Konti apratijani hi name bhakta pranashyati. That the Lord promises that my devotee will always get protection by me, no matter what. So he makes two promises. He promises to protect his devotees, but he also promises not to fight. So the promises are contrary. <laughs> so what to do? So he decides. Well, my reputation is at stake if I, if I decide to fight, but still my devotee is more important. So you can't trust Krishna. <laughs> he says one thing and he does something else. <laughs> you know, his cane is crooked, you know? That means, you know. His cane. <laughs> but that's why everybody wrote, they say, why should we worship Krishna? You know, he says one thing and then he does something different, you know? What kind of God is that? And let me worship Ram. He's better. When he speaks something, he doesn't change. You know? <laughs> He's righteous. And that's just a little antidote. Because Krishna always acts for the benefit of everyone. And especially in this case, for the benefit of his devotees. And so Krishna jumped down. He grabbed the chariot wheel and he came charging at Bhishma Dev. So he was so angry at Bhishma Dev that his charter was flying in the wind and the charter flew out, off Krishna's body. And Krishna didn't even care. He just kept charging at Bhishma. And Bhishma Dev was thinking, Jai, <laughs> now my life is perfect. This was what I've been waiting for, to have the exchange because Bhishma Dev has a relationship with Krishna and chivalry ras. There are five primary rasas and there are seven secondary rasas. Primary rasas is neutrality, servitudeship, friendship, parental affection and conjugal love. And the secondary rasas are more or less qualities that one will apply in relationship to the primary ras. But in this case Bhishma Dev's secondary ras is his primary ras with Krishna. And he likes, he also is friends with Krishna, but he fights with Krishna also. So he was thinking, the perfection of my life is now happening. And there's an exchange. And of course, you know, Arjuna is fighting, shooting chariots, I mean, arrows at Bhishma Dev at the same time. And then Bhishma Dev is defeated. And he's laying on the bed of arrows, and now this is where he comes to this particular thing. But because he had the benediction that he could die whenever he wanted, no matter what was happening to him, even though his body was permeated with arrows, you can see the pictures. His body was elevated off the ground simply by the arrows piercing through his body, and he was laying on the bed of arrows. But he was still conscious. And he was in great pain, of course. But at the same time, here it says, 
as soon as he saw the beautiful transcendental form of Krishna in his mind and heart, all of his pain was gone completely. He was completely freed from all of the severity that those arrows were giving him. And now he is meditating and seeing Krishna face to face. Srila Prabhupada wants to make, give us a clear understanding that this material body that we inhabit is simply a covering over the soul. The mind, the senses, the intelligence are all like shadows covering the actual person. The material mind does not exist. It's simply a covering over the spiritual mind. The material, as it mentions here, the senses are also spiritual. So what is material senses? So if you use your spiritual senses in relationship to trying to enjoy the material energy, those senses become contaminated by that energy and therefore they are, they are given the definition as material. But ultimately, the body, the, the spiritual body is the real body and the material body, as it says here, is illusion. So is our material body illusion? Yes and no. <laughs> yes in the sense of the definition that it doesn't stand the test of time. Because truth means that which doesn't change. If something changes, it's not truth. It may be true for a particular time, but according to Shastra, that type, of de that type of definition of truth simply means illusion. Prabhupada tells the story of truth and beauty. You've heard that story? <laughs> Everybody heard that story, truth and beauty? Should I tell it? I don't hear anybody saying yes or no. Yes, yes. Yeah, those who know it might say no. <laughs> Okay, all right, so there was one prince and he was traveling throughout his kingdom. Now Prabhupada write a, wrote an article based on this particular pastime. There was a prince and he was traveling throughout his kingdom and he wanted to see who was in his kingdom. And so he stopped, he saw one little hermitage, so he knocked on the door to see who was there. And so a very beautiful young girl opened the door. And who, as soon as he saw her, he became infatuated and attracted to her. And he introduced himself, who he was, and he said, I am the prince and I can see you are a suitable wife for me. <laughs> he was a little proud of his position. Now she was quite saintly and she wasn't interested in his proposals. So she didn't know what to say because he was the prince and she was thinking, what am I going to do? I'm not really interested, but what, how can I tell him no? So she thought of a plan. She said, all right, you're so attractive, but you give me one week and you can come back and then I will agree. So, okay. So I wonder, he goes away, and uh, during that one week, she decides to change her beautiful appearance. <laughs> so she takes purgatives, laxatives, and passes stool, urine, vomit, and her whole body becomes totally emaciated. And what she does is collects all of that ingredients from her body and keeps it into big buckets. <laughs> now this went on for a whole week. Now she's collecting it, keeping it in the back part of her house. Now, when week is up, the king comes, the prince comes riding on his horse and he's very enthusiastic. He's going to meet this beautiful girl. She's going to become his wife. And so he knocks on the door, she opens the door, and he said, excuse me, old lady, but where is that uh, 
young girl that was here, and, uh, she said, that's me. No, you, that's not you. <laughs> yes, it is me. Don't you recognize me? What? No, it is. Oh, she said, you're so attracted to my beauty, so I saved it for you. <laughs> Come back here and you can have all of it and all of these nice big buckets. <laughs> and so it's described and it's also drawn. There's a picture drawn of this whole particular scene. He goes back there and then he realizes what is the difference between truth and beauty. Truth is beautiful, but what is actually truth is beautiful, but something that is not truth is not beautiful. In other words, it doesn't stand the test of time. So Prabhupada wrote an article, and that became one of the Back to Godhead magazines. And so the material body is important because Atato Brahma Jigasa, in the human form of life, we can use the material body in order to reach the platform of perfection. And no other species of life can one attain self-realization, only in the human form of life. So the material body has value. And because the soul resides within the body, I exist within the body, therefore the body is important. But I'm not the body. <laughs> that is the basic principles which Krishna taught in, our, in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita. He said, what is that verse? Um, Never was a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor all in the future, sir, any of us should cease to be. Uh, the embodied soul goes from boyhood to youth to old age. Similarly, the self-realized soul attains another, one who is self attains another. In other words, the body transforms or disintegrates and the soul transmigrates from one species of life to another. Karanam guna sango so sadasajone janmashu. So life after life, we're getting different bodies. Sometimes we're a man, sometimes we're a woman. Sometimes we're, you know, maybe a demigod in a higher planet. Sometimes we're something else. So it doesn't mean we neglect the body, but the body, as it says here, is simply a covering over the real person, the soul. And therefore, our Bhishma Dev, he's on the platform of self-realization. His body is full of arrows. He's laying on the battlefield, but he is in transcendental happiness. He's blissful. He's not feeling any of the effects of having a material body because he's in the presence of Krishna. And one who can associate with Krishna through the process of devotional service, gradually the contamination and even the awareness of the material body diminishes. And one starts to see, oh yes, I have a material body, but we don't, the devotees pay less and less attention to the material body and more attention to Krishna. And as that happens, the, because the materialists, they're always thinking how to keep this body comfortable, how to provide everything you need for the body. And this becomes the absorption of material life. But the devotee is always thinking, if I can simply serve Krishna, and get the association of Krishna through the service of Krishna, then there's no more material body, and there's no more effects of the material body. Although one is living, it's like a dream, just like when you go to sleep at night, you dream. When you dream, sometimes you see yourself in a dream. Have you ever had that experience? You dream and you're looking at yourself in the dream and you're going through different situations. So who's looking and who's, who's in the dream? There's two people happening at once. There's you watching yourself. Which one is you? <laughs> the one in the dream or the one that's watching? The one that's watching is the one is, who is you. That's the soul is actually seeing yourself in the dream. 
So that is the night dream. So when you come in the waking hours, like we are now, this is a daydream. <laughs> That's all it is. We're dreaming. I'm a, whoever I am, and my material identity is just part of the dream. So sometimes you watch yourself even in the daydream, right? What am I doing? What's going on? You reflect sometimes like that. But the daydream seems to be more real than the night dream. But both are dreams. <laughs> The only difference is one is longer than the other. That's, that's the only difference. And then when we get freed from this material body, then we realize, you know, it was just a dream. You know, I'm disillusioned in this material world, and that's all it is. And that's the goal of life, is to get, get free from the, 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 the awareness of this material body and to take shelter of our true identity and be situated on the spiritual platform. And so Bhishma Dave, he's fixed, I and mean, he has reached that stage. And now you'll see all great personalities, Vyasadeva, Krishna, many of all of the Pandavas, and many, Narada Muni, and so many great souls, they arrive at Bhishma Dave's bedside on the battlefield. And now Yudhisthira, he's now been victorious and he's about to take the throne, the king of the world. And Krishna wants to enlighten Yudhisthira in how to lead the world according to uh, leadership principles. And so he inspires Bhishma Dev to instruct Yudhisthira. And Bhishma Dev instructs Yudhisthira for two weeks. Simply, he stays on that battlefield. Actually, it was more than two weeks. It was something like just short of three weeks. And, and, and when the sun reached the meridian of the northern meridian, which is known as the solstice, the, nor the northern solstice, which is known as, what is the name of that? Uh, that particular uh, so today Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, what is it? Huh? Sankranti, yeah, two words. Makara Sankranti, yeah, thank you very much. Mantara, Makara Sankranti, when Makara Sankranti usually comes January 14th or 15th, depending on the year. And then he, at that point he attained perfection and he went back home back to the spiritual world. So this is this, the story of Bhishma Dev, his life is very, very wonderful, very instructive. And how he was completely absorbed in worshiping Krishna and how he uh, showed by example that anyone who is against Krishna no matter how powerful you are, you lose. In other words, Bhishma Dev could not be defeated, but still he took the opposite side. And he wanted to show the world, this is the internal reason why Bhishma Dev accepted service from Duryodhana, why? to show that whoever you are, it doesn't matter. If you're against Krishna, you lose. <laughs> so, and therefore anyone who aligns themselves with Krishna is victorious. So, as long as we stay fixed in this Krishna consciousness process, your Prabhupada said you're guaranteed to go back home, back to Godhead. No matter how difficult it may come, no matter how much material energy may pose so many difficulties, if we stay fixed on Krishna consciousness, eventually we'll reach the stage of perfection and go back home, back to Godhead. Whether it happens in this life, which is the, the idea, or it happens in the future life, it will happen in due course of time. <laughs> Never leave Krishna. <laughs> Krishna Matta, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. Krishna Matta, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. Krishna is your mother. Krishna is your father. 
Krishna is the treasure of your life. <laughs> okay, so would anyone like to add anything to the class or ask a question, comment, anyone? Mm -hmm. Neela, do you have a question? No? No questions. Something's going on with, amongst the brahmacharis over there. I'm not sure what's, what, what's going to happen next. This is like the the Gupta Leela here, okay. No question? Yes, okay, we got a question. You see, every, you should have, every class should have at least one question. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj, for the uh, wonderful talk. Okay. Talk. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I have one question. You mentioned that uh, mm -hmm. whoever is on the side of Krishna is always successful and always emerges victorious. Now, uh, we have been hearing in the news, uh, around a few months back also, uh, the temple in Bangladesh was vandalized. And even yesterday we got to hear some news that another temple in Bangladesh was vandalized. Again? But, yeah. Around 200 people stormed the temple and uh, they broke everything in the temple. And no one was killed, unfortunately, but there were people who were hurt. So, I wanted to understand what should be the Krishna conscious perspective of understanding this incident. We're not following Prabhupada's instructions. He said, make Kshatriya Dharma. Get the, train the devotees to protect the temples. I've been pushing that for 10 years. We need Kshatriya Dharma in our society. The devotees are now prepared. Prabhupada said, yeah, we should be ready for attack and be ready to defend. We have to defend the deities, we have to defend the temples, we have to defend the devotees, we have to defend the, the, the property. This is all belonging to Krishna. Why are we not organizing and being ready? When that first thing happened in Bangladesh many months ago, the devotees in Mayapur began programs for training Kshatriyas. But we're not fast enough. Prabhupada wanted it. He spoke about it. He said, you know, we should have temples where their devotees can defend if we are attacked by outsiders. I mean, some temples do have it, but very few, just very few. Like where I am in Slovenia, we have a whole cadre of kshatriyas there. And nobody will dare come near their temple. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, you know, we should, you know, we're, we're not just like chanting Hare Krishna. We have to fight sometimes. And it's not fighting in an aggressive way. It's a fighting in a protective way. So we don't seem to get it. <laughs> We have to have that kind of protection in our, in our temples. And this is part of Varnashram. You have the Brahmins, you have the Kshatriyas, you have the Vaishyas, you have the, these three higher classes. Prabhupada said, set up Varnashram College and train devotees in these three Varnas. Prabhupada started the movement by training Brahmins. So the movement is very Brahminical. That is our movement. But we have a whole group of devotees who are very expert in fighting. Many, but they're not given any service. <laughs> they're not given any service. So every temple should be ready for some attack and be ready to defend the temples. So, I mean, we don't learn. How many times did Bangladesh get attacked? <laughs> And uh, it's not that we are aggressors or we like to fight, but you know, we have to protect. And obviously the law enforcement agencies are not interested in giving protection, especially in Bangladesh. 
If you would call the police, they wouldn't come. They wouldn't come. Because, <laughs> you know, we're not so popular in Bangladesh, you know, because the country is 85% Islamic. And 12% are Hindus, and 3% are a mixture of other groups. <laughs> so 85%. But it's only a small group who are attacking. It's not that the Islamic population is against the Hindus, it's just a small militant group. So, so that's, that's my, my concern, uh, because I've been preaching this for a long time, and we did some work to try to get Kshatriya Dharma started in our society, but it hasn't really developed. You have Kshatriyas here. Yeah, this temple, there are, I, know, I know them personally. <laughs> but it has to be done where they should, the devotees have to be on site if something happens. Because right now, the world is in such a critical condition that it can happen anywhere, at any time, in any place. So, we're not following Srila Prabhupada's instructions. And that's why, and then this is the result. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, no one was killed, right? Which place was it? Hmm? Bunny? I'm not sure where that is. Yeah. It's sad to hear these things, but we don't learn. But some temples are really equipped with some devotees already are there on site if anything happens they'll come out and defend the, the devotees defend the, de the deities we have to defend the deities when I was in New Vrindavan in 1973 we were attacked by a motorcycle gang in the temple and they came they came with guns and four devotees got shot and uh, they broke the deities they broke the altar, and uh, you know it could have been much worse, but somehow or other Krishna saved it in this situation. But that was in 1973, and after that, Prabhupada was there at the time. That was June 5th, 1973. I remember that because I was there in the in this situation. And Prabhupada, when he heard about that, he sent in one devotee who was a Green Beret in, in Vietnam. He was a fighter. And he came and he trained the devotees in New Vrindavan. We were, we were learning military fighting in New Vrindavan. <laughs> I was in the army. I was in the army for four years and I thought, oh my God, I got to go through this again. <laughs> I didn't want to get, uh, so, but you know, devotees were learning to fire rifles. We were marching left, right, calisthenics, and getting ready. And this went on, and for so we could protect our, because we were in an area where people didn't like us, and so they attacked the temple. So much so, four devotees were shot. One died later, and. We went to court against this motorcycle gang. We had so many witnesses, and the, the judge said, insufficient evidence. <laughs> he threw the whole case out. None of them got prosecuted, none of them. But one of them got a reaction after that, a very severe reaction because he, he had come so, yeah, our temple's been attacked so many times. Look what happened in Lithuania. A militant gang ta attacked the, the devotees in Lithuania. And the devotees were killed. They ravaged the whole temple, stole all the, the money in the temple, everything. So, I mean, there's been so many series of events. Maybe we're not aware of so many, but it's happened throughout the history of our movement. So Prabhupada, yeah, so Prabhupada was very enthusiastic 
that after that attack in New, in New Vrindavan, he, tr he wanted all the devotees to be ready. And so we were ready for after that. We had a whole cadre of devotees to ready to protect the temple. Mm -hmm. So Bangladesh obviously is a place where, you know, it could happen at any time. It's just the way it is. So hopefully we'll become more aware of the need to organize our temples in such a way that there will be, if anyone attacks, they'll be able to defend like that. There was one devotee, that same devotee, that he came and defended in, uh, in Hamburg, Germany. It was John Mastami. I think it was around 1972 in John Mastami. So the devotees had a big John Mastami festival. And now the festival was over, it was the middle of the night, so three motorcycle gangs, big, these big guys riding on the motorcycles with chains and leather jackets, they decided to crash the Hare Krishna temple. So they drove their bicycles right through the door, crashed, and they knocked the whole door down, and then they start beating up the devotees. The devotees woke up, it was like the middle of the night right after the John Mastami festival. That devotee who I mentioned, his name was Uttareda, the one that Prabhupada sent in the train, he was there at the time. When he saw what happened, he told all the devotees, move aside. He took an iron bar and he fought the three of them by himself. Two of them ran and the other one never got up again. <laughs> Just one devotee who knows, he knows how to fight, he just pushed those three guys out. And that temple was never bothered again, <laughs> obviously. So this is, yeah, so, so there are devotees, I know, I know a whole list of at least 30, 40, 50 devotees who are highly trained in martial arts, but they're not given any service, you know? <laughs> and that's the, that's the problem. <laughs> All we have to do is use them. They'll be happy to serve. They'll be happy to serve. You have one devotee here. I know his name. He's very, he's, he's a martial artist here. He's connected with this temple. And I was working with him to try to set up Kshatriya Dharma in a general way. And he came. His whole family is Kshatriya. His wife, his kids, kids were about 10 years old, they were good fighters also. So yeah, we need that. It's part of Vanashram. And Prabhupada said, unless we set up Vanashram, where our society cannot continue to develop in a progressive way. So Vanashram is the, is the foundation for the social organization of the spiritual process. We have to have that social organization. But in our society, it's Daivi Vanashram. Daivi means we serve the Lord according to our material qualities, our tendencies. People serve as Brahmanas, people serve as Kshatriyas, people serve as Vaishyas, like that. We have our Govardhan Ekar village, devotees are taking care of cows, doing agriculture. That's Vaishya, Dhar, uh, Vaishya Varna, but it's being gauged into Krishna consciousness, therefore it's spiritual. So that was Prabhupada's program, to train devotees according to their nature. Because in this age, Kalo Sudra Sambhavan, everyone is born generally because of the age of Kali, they need training according to their nature. So it's, Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavatam that the spiritual master's duty is to see the disciple, understand the nature of the disciple, and engage that disciple according to that nature. And then that's, that disciple will make quick advancement. Anyone who works according to their nature 
will make fast progress because that's their, their it's called Swadharma, but now it becomes Daivi Vanashram. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm so, I'm so uh, unhappy to hear that it happened again. It's just, I don't know when we're going to actually get ready as a society because the secular society is going through a lot of difficulties. I mean, there's war, there's pestilence, there's economic, uh, everything is falling apart on a social and political economic level. So that means there may also be, you know, chances that our temples will also be, you know, affected by that. So we have to be ready. <laughs> I can think of hundreds, not hundreds, but at least dozens of incidents throughout our history of our society where we've been, we've been attacked by outsiders. You know. And sometimes we've been successful in warding off these attacks, but a lot of other times, and especially in these cases, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.